whole chapter. <clears throat> How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Haram, Haram was falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestowed his blessing, even life forevermore. So be it. Normally I'm a little more dressed than this, but I usually dress casually, so I'm probably not going to get a compliment today, am I? Will you still give me one? Okay. Because <laughs> we've got the community service afterwards, and I wanted to be in dress that wouldn't matter quite as much. <clears throat> but Virginia, whenever I tuck my shirt in and put my belt on and stuff, she says, good sermon when she leaves, and you look sharp. <laughs> so let's start with prayer this morning. Father, we humbly come before you today. We are so honored to be loved by you, that you would love us enough that you would send your son to die for us, to restore us to a right relationship with you, that through your spirit we are born again, and from that we can cry, Abba, Father. And today we call upon your spirit to bind us together, one another, with strong cords that cannot be broken, Father, that we will be united in the name of Jesus Christ to proclaim his name with boldness to this world. And we long for the time when Jesus returns and carries us home. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So if you didn't hear or you didn't know or you were gone away or on another planet or something, we had Vacation Bible School here this week. And it was a blessing. We had a lot of people serve. And I would like to recognize you now. So if you served at all in Vacation Bible School, stand please. Yeah, come on. If you helped in any form or fashion, get up, girls. These people were such a blessing, and I think they were probably blessed just as much. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. You may be seated. Thanks for letting us. Oh, it's a blessing. And there was unity. Four churches came together. Even the pastors came on Friday. They were here. So we had the pastors here on Friday cooking and everything. It was a great time, a good thing for unity, and if you haven't heard, after today's service, 11.30, at the high school football fields, we're going to come together as churches again to speak unity to this country, to this community. And the Holy Spirit is what seals us as God's child. John, we've been studying John for the past, I don't know, just John chapter 12 even for the past few months. John was one that rained, wanted to rain down fire from heaven on people. But then as you read his works more and more, especially when you go to 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you'll see how much he talks about love and Christian love. He says, if you know God, you will love your brother. If you don't love your brother, you're a liar in your belief. Love is what binds us together so that people know that we are the children of God. So that they can see a difference in us. So that they start asking, what, what is it about you? Who is this Jesus that you say that you follow? So I've entitled this um, sermon, United We Stand. That sounds like something that would be from a war commander or something talking about, well, we've got to be united in this battlefront. And we do fight a spiritual battle. Paul tells us that. Day and night the devil is roaming around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And all he wants is to get one little foothold in your life so he can hold you down. And Paul tells us to strip off anything that hinders us because we're running a race. We're running for the prize. And that was one of our Bible verses from, from this week. <clears throat> United we stand is not from anything like that, though. Do you know what it's from? It gets its origin back to Aesop's fables is where it comes from. Back in B.C. times. Here's what was said in a... In a story called The Four Oxen and the Lion. A lion used to prowl about a field in which four oxen used to dwell. 
Many a time he tried to attack them. But whenever he came near, they turned their tails to warn each other, so that whichever way he approached them, he was met by the horns of one of them. At last, however, they fell a-quarreling among themselves. Hmm. And each went off to pasture alone in the separate corner of the field. Then the lion attacked them one by one and soon made an end of all four. That's the origin of united we stand. And the opposite of that, but in there, you know what but means, right? The complete opposite. Divided we fall. We talked about that in vacation Bible school a lot. We talked about where Paul said it was a race. We talked about our theme was with man, this is impossible, Matthew 19, 26. But with God, that but again, all things are possible. And we discussed that. I discussed that with my kids. And I said, what is this this in this phrase? Because it says this is impossible for man. And if you read that scripture, it's about the young, rich, educated ruler who had everything that this world could offer him. And he came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And see, you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We are God's hands and feet, salt to the earth, to give flavor and to give preservative to the earth so that people will know that we're the children of God, so that they can see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And it goes on, the, Jesus says, well, all you need to do is keep all the commands of the law. But as we know, we cannot do that. Even the kids realized that they couldn't do that. Some of them said, oh, yeah, I, I do pretty good on that. Well, pretty good's not good enough. Because if you keep reading, the young rich ruler said, uh, yeah, I kept all those arrogantly. And he probably thought in his mind he did because he concentrated so much on the things rather than on the relationship that he had. And he fell short of those things and didn't even see it. And some of the kids that didn't realize they saw it, I got down to the part where it says, uh, honor your father and mother. And then they were like, oops, we missed that one, didn't we? And I said, this is what this scripture is talking about. It is impossible for man to reach God. It's impossible for them to achieve eternal life. But, complete opposite of that, with God all things are possible. And He loves you so much, no matter what you do, anything else, that He gave His Son to die for you to be in that right relationship. And that's what we taught for Vacation Bible School. Well, this morning we read Psalms 133, the whole chapter. <laughs> and the psalmist wrote about unity in this way. It says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, the high priest of Israel down on the collar of his robes, which have all of the twelve tribes of Israel scribed together on them. Unity, but we know from history, from reading the Bible, that they weren't so united a lot of the times, were they? It is as the dew of Hermon, Mount Hermon, were, were falling on Mount Zion. If you know anything about Israel, Mount Hermon is where it's cool. It's 9,000 feet elevation. There's snow there sometimes. There's always dew and moisture. But in Jerusalem, it's dry and dusty, and it's saying here that that dew is falling upon, giving moisture to Jerusalem, Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows His blessing, even life forevermore, just like we were reading in Matthew, that God is the supplier of life evermore, that He wants us to be in a relationship with Him, that He loves us enough that He would send His only Son to die for our sins. So I want to look a little bit about what unity means in the Bible today. And the first passage I'm going to do is in the Old Testament from 2 Chronicles. I think you were talking about that this morning. Chapter 30, verses 1 through 14. And let's look at an example when the Israelites were unified. Starting in verse 1, Hezekiah sent word to all Israel and Judah. Two different camps at this point. They weren't very united. Also wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, inviting them to come to the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. The king and his officials and the whole assembly in Jerusalem decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month. They had not been able to celebrate it at a regular time because not enough priests had consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. Well, it sounds like today we're going to come together and assemble but we have division among us. Let's see what happens. <clears throat> Verse 5, They decided to send a proclamation 
Uh, sorry, verse 4. The plan seemed right both to the king and to the whole assembly. They decided to send a proclamation throughout Israel from Beersheba to Dan, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. It had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. They already knew the law. They knew what, how they were supposed to celebrate. At the king's command, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters from the king and from officials which read, People of Israel, return to the Lord the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he, that he may return to, to you who are left, who have escaped from the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not be like your parents and fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them an object of horror, as you see. Do not be stiff-necked, and we've been talking about that in John chapter 12, had not we? Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to His sanctuary, which He has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God, so that His fierce anger will turn away from you. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn His face from you if you return to Him. What did we talk about last week? If they would simply turn. And I'm not even going to go to John 12 today, but look, it's right here again in Chronicles. The couriers went from town to town in Ephraim and Manasseh as far as Zebulun, but people scorned and ridiculed them. Nevertheless, some from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Also in Judah, the hand of God was on the people to give them unity of mind, is what the NIV says. The King James Version says, one heart. It's a Hebrew word, echad. It means oneness. It means the number one. It means to make one, to make complete, to make whole or perfect. They went there to carry out what the king and his officials had ordered, following the word of the Lord. A very large crowd of people assembled in Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread in the second month. They removed the altars in Jerusalem and cleared away the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. So we have an example here of people who did not have unity, who come together and they throw out the false idols and temples and start worshiping the Lord like He has called for them to do. Now we're not in John chapter 12, but doesn't that sound familiar? All of the crowds gathered together to see if this was Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the promised one, the one who would save their people from their sins. And he came in before Passover. And they said, Hosanna, save us. Because they recognized the mighty deeds, or as John says, the signs that Jesus performed. But as we read on in that chapter, we see the word but that many did not believe in the miracles. And then we saw that some did believe, and we see the positive there. But we get the but again. They failed to proclaim Jesus because they were afraid of what others would think or do to them. What a shame. But we have an example here of what happens when people come together united. Now we're going to get to the New Testament in a minute too. But I want to show you again where the word echad is used. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. Maybe you recognize it. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Echad. In the New Testament, Jesus quotes this verse. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 and 29. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer... He asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, hear, O Christian, hear those who say that they believe. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now the New Testament is written in Greek, so the word here is called heis in Greek. And what does it mean again? One, oneness. It can be the number one. To be made Whole and perfect. It still carries the same meaning. A lot of times from language to language, the words don't carry the same meaning. Even repentance in the Bible. To repent in the Old Testament does have a 
issue of remorse. In the New Testament, repent doesn't have an issue of remorse. It means to turn, to change your mind so that you will turn. And then repentance comes. So you keep works that show your repentance, that show your proof. Because Jesus and John the Baptist both said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The time that he, that he was going to call His children together. Because Jesus was going to leave this earth, and He was going to leave behind His followers to carry on what Jesus proclaimed, taught, and lived. And we have the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. Sometimes we forget that. It was God who created us. It was God who came to this earth and saved us. It is God who will walk through us, live through us, teach us about Jesus through His Word, sanctify us and make us holy as we mature and grow through the power of the Spirit. We're not orphaned. We're not left alone. Jesus even said, It is better for you that I leave because then the Holy Spirit will indwell in each and every one of us rather than Jesus walking with us. But we've got to be united. We've got to realize that regardless of what problems we have with one another, what divisions that we have, that we're united for the purpose of proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. And any division says that, God, we really don't honor you and put you on the throne. Jesus, we're glad of what you did, but maybe we're not as glad as we should be. And Holy Spirit, I don't know that you have the power to live inside of me to do this. Because it's God all the way through as long as you will submit to Him. Turn, submit to Him, and let Him live His life through you. If you will be obedient. Put Him on the throne instead of ourselves on the throne. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6, Paul writes this. As a prisoner for the Lord. Prisoner. He's enslaved. He's a bond slave, a servant. He considers his life and everything in this world rubbish or garbage compared to proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the grace that God has sent to this earth. So I urge you, I beg you, I plead with you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Because we have been called out. Ecclesia is the word for church. Jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against them. And that word means a congregation, a group called out for a purpose. And our purpose is to proclaim Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I beg you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely, totally humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul writes in Corinthians, when they're arguing about everything, especially the, the more prestigious gifts like tongue, he said, let me show you a better way. Love, love, love. Just like John said, love. Make every effort to keep unity. This is a new word. Not a new word, in it, but this is the first time we're hearing it today. It's called, and I'm going to try this one, hednates. I might have did pretty good, I'm not sure. <laughs> it means unity and agreement within people. And he says, make every effort to keep unity of the Spirit. We can't do it on our own. But with God, all things are, vacation Bible leaders, thank you, possible. Good, you were listening. Yay! <laughs> hey, if you want to do the song, we can do it in a little bit. I have no problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 4 goes on to say, There is one, the word is heis again, body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Therefore, as a result of all the things that God has done for you, as God's chosen people, Peter tells us that we're a holy priesthood, that we're the temple now. We don't have to go through Aaron anymore. Our bodies are the temple of the Lord because the Holy Spirit, God Himself, indwells in us. Jacob is at the walk is where he's at. That's why he's not here today. And he texted me the other night. He wasn't supposed to be. <laughs> and he must have got caught because he hasn't texted me since. 
But he was talking about from Isaiah, they were talking and it says, I believe in Isaiah 7, I might be wrong, it's Isaiah 7, 8, 9, somewhere in there. Isaiah makes a prophecy and he says, before the boy reaches um, the point where he knows right from wrong, and it's a prophecy about the Messiah, about Jesus. And Jacob was like, does that mean that he could have done right and wrong before? And I said, you can't take one verse out of context, son. I said, you've got to read the whole Bible. What does it say about Jesus? It says that He is God. It says that He was righteous and holy without sin when He died for us. So that that sacrifice that He gave for us was acceptable. So He could say it is finished, it is complete. And Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So I said what Isaiah was saying is before he reaches the age where he does know right and wrong, doesn't say that he did any wrong before that, but before he reaches this age, that prophecy will come true. So you've got to read the Bible as a whole and everything. Because see, Jesus Christ could not have sinned because He is God. And His sacrifice was perfect. And we have been cleansed from all unrighteousness. Our sins cast as far as the east from the west as long as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So in Colossians, I'm going to start again. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dear love, clothe yourself with these things, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Here we have it again. Bear with each other. We just read that in Ephesians. And forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Because we were enemies when Christ died for us. Verse 14, And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Here's another word. It's called, uh, this one's longer again, tehelitas. It means perfectness, oneness. Verse 15 goes on to say, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as a member of one, since, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through the Psalms. That's what we read this morning, what we're going to concentrate on for our unity, how good and pleasing it is when God's people are united. Through Psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Now, if you haven't noticed with unity, there's a theme here. It's one. It comes from the one God through the one Son, Jesus Christ. And we live it through the one Spirit as long as we let Him. So Jesus, before He left this earth, said a prayer for all believers. You can read it in John 17, verses 20 through 26. And guess what it's a prayer about? Unity in the body of Christ. Verse 20 says, My prayer is not for them alone, because He's already prayed for the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in Me through their message, that's us, that all of them may be one. Father, just as You are in Me and I am in You, may they also be one, is implied here, in us, so that the world may believe. They're not going to believe if we're out there saying one thing and doing something else. That's called hypocrisy. It's acting. It's what the Pharisees were. They were actors on a stage rather than living the way they were supposed to live. That they may be one as we are one. Verse 23, In them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Different word again. Telaio. It means one again. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me if we are united together. Regardless of what our denominations are, regardless of where we live, if we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are His church, called out to preach the gospel message. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. And that's what Isaiah talked what. Jesus quoted Isaiah 4 in John 12 because he saw the glory of Jesus way back 600 years before Jesus. You have given, see the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, through the world, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. 
I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Unity is a huge, huge thing from the beginning of the Bible to the end. The Godhead is unified and we are brought in as children to be unified, to proclaim the gospel message. But this is impossible for man. But all things are with God. Matthew 19, 26b says, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We have the keys literally to the kingdom of heaven to proclaim God's love through Jesus Christ as long as we are willing to do that, to be called out, united together. Vacation Bible School was a huge example of that, and I hope it carries over into today. That four churches can come together, and I didn't hear any quarrels. There may have been some, but if they were, they were put out and focused on teaching those kids about Jesus Christ. And what a blessing it is. And I think anyone will tell you that did serve that, yeah, it was long and tiring and hot. Oh, it was nearly 100 one day and the air conditioners froze up. They wouldn't keep up with the day. But it was worth it. It was worth serving to see that. Because God loves those who are faithful and serve Him. And Jesus even said in Revelation, one of the last things, that He is coming and bringing His reward back with Him. So as believers, God's children, I ask you to unite today. And the first thing I ask you to unite with is if the ladies, Sherry and Debbie, are not here because they're already making sandwiches downstairs. They might need some help. I've already made tea and I need some help loading some tables and things. So that's the first thing you can do to unite and help. Next thing you can do is start with me right now and let's pray for unity in this county through our churches for a revival for these kids that have been preached the gospel message and their parents and stuff to hear the Word, to impact their hearts. And a lot of these kids had no idea about a lot of the Bible studies or stories and stuff. And, and I've seen a lot of them over and over. But when we asked, what story was it we asked if they knew about? They knew about Jonah and stuff, but we asked about one and they didn't, I can't remember what it was, a big time Old Testament story. They had no idea who I was talking to, about. That's the reason that I started coming to this church. I got a couple kids that came to live with me and I started reading them Bible stories and I was blown away that they had never heard of David and Goliath, never heard of Noah and the ark. So I started reading those Bible stories and then brought them into the Awanas program. And when we finished out Awanas this year, we had around 40 kids. What a blessing it is and God is faithful. His word will not come back void. So let's go to prayer and then we'll be dismissed after we do whatever songs. So will you get Debbie? And if you want to do a VBS song, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> You've got them in your head. So I'm going to pray if you'll pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, we do thank you, Lord. Your ways are perfect and true. And we don't have to know about everything, but we know that the sun comes up, whether we think that we revolve around the sun or which way it is, and we, the more we learn, the more we do find out that your word proclaims your glories. But we know that that sun will heat us and give us life. And we know that you're the giver of all life. And Father, we thank you for these children that we've been able to teach your word to. Father, we pray that if there are any divisions of any kind, anything that need forgiveness for, that today is a day of reconciliation, that your word is proclaimed, that Christian love is seen throughout our community, that this is the start of a revival in this community. Father, we need you so much, and we want to humbly lay our lives before you on the throne to serve you, because you loved us enough that instead of giving us the wages of our sin, which is death, you gave us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, if we would simply believe. With man, there is no way we can ever reach you. And that's what sets Christianity apart, because you loved us enough to come to us. That you would give up your own son's life as atonement for our sins. And then you would seal us with your spirit, not just as your children, but to walk with us, to guide us, to teach us your word, to bring about unity in the body of Christ. 
so that Jesus' church will continue to grow and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We thank you for the freedom that we have to proclaim your name. And we pray that we will proclaim you with boldness, just as the first church did in Acts. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.